I think it will begin like this. Dawn. The shells on a beach. What does it mean then? What can it all mean? Lily Briscoe asked herself. Unreality. Things oddly proportioned. For really, what did she feel come back after all these years? Mrs. Ramsay dead, Andrew killed, Prue dead too. Repeated as she might, it roused no feeling in her. The unreal world must be all around this. Nothing. Nothing. The phantom waves. Nothing that she could express at all. Could one not get the waves to be heard all through? Where were her paints? Really, these premonitions of a book, states of soul in creating, are very queer and little apprehended. She would start at once. I'm a little anxious. How am I to bring off this conception? Yes, it must have been precisely here that she'd stood 10 years ago. There was the wall, the hedge, the tree. The question was of some relation between those masses. She'd borne it in her mind all these years. The past only comes back when present runs so smoothly that it is like the sliding surface of a deep river. Then one sees through the surface to the depths. It seemed as if the solution had come to her. She knew now what she wanted to do. I suppose the danger is the damned egotistical self. Is one pliant and rich enough to provide a wall for the book from oneself without its becoming narrowing and restricting? Ugh. Mr. Ramsay. Ugh. She did her best to look when his back was turned at a picture, that line there, that mass there, but, oh, it was out of the question. Let him be 50 feet away. Let him not even speak to you. He permeated, he prevailed. He changed everything. Father's birthday. He would have been 96, 96, yes, today, and could have been 96, like other people one has known, but mercifully was not. She could not see the color. She could not see the lines, even with his back turned to her. She could only think, but he'll be down on me in a moment, demanding something she could not give him. His life would have entirely ended mine. What would have happened? No writing, no books, inconceivable. That man, she thought, her anger rising in her, never gave, that man took. She, on the other hand, would be forced to give. Women have served all these centuries as looking glasses, possessing the magic and delicious power of reflecting the figure of man at twice its natural size. Ah, oh, here he was, stopped by her side. <sighs> she would give him what she could. Was anybody looking after her, he said. Had she everything she wanted? Oh, oh thanks, everything. No, she could not do it. Ah, there was an awful pause. They both looked at the sea. Instantly there issued from him such a groan that any other woman in the whole world would have done something, said something. All except myself, thought Lily, girding at herself bitterly, who am not a woman, but a peevish, ill-tempered, dried up old maid, presumably. He waited. Was she not going to say anything? Did she not see what he wanted from her? Still, Lily said nothing. Then he said, had a particular reason for wanting to go to the lighthouse. His wife used to send the men things. It was a poor boy with a tuberculous hip, the light keeper's son. He sighed significantly. Still, she could say nothing. Uh, the whole horizon seemed swept bare of objects to talk about. Such expeditions, said Mr. Ramsay, scraping the ground with his toe, are very painful. One said, uh, 
What did one say? Oh, Mr. Ramsay, dear Mr. Ramsay. They are very exhausting. In complete silence, she stood there grasping her paintbrush. Mr. Ramsay exerted upon her solitary figure the immense pressure of his concentrated woe, his age, his frailty, his desolation, when suddenly, tossing his head impatiently in his annoyance, for after all, what woman could resist him, he noticed that his bootlaces were untied. Remarkable boots they were, too, Lily thought, looking down at them, sculptured, colossal, like everything that Mr. Ramsay wore. She could see them walking to his room of their own accord, expressive of pathos, surliness, ill temper, charm. What beautiful boots, she exclaimed. No, oh, she was ashamed of herself to praise his boots when he asked her to solace his soul. But Mr. Ramsay smiled. Ah, yes, he said, holding his foot up for her to look at. They were first rate boots. They were made of the finest leather in the world. Most leather was mere brown paper and cardboard. They had reached, she felt, this, a sunny island where peace dwelt, sanity reigned, and the sun forever shone. He looked complacently at his foot, still held in the air. The blessed island of good boots. Now, let me see if you can tie a knot, he said. Uh, her heart warmed to him. He poo-pooed her feeble system. Why at this completely inappropriate moment? He showed her his own invention. He was stooping over her shoe. Should she be so tormented with sympathy for him that the, the blood rushed to her face? Once you tied it, never came undone. In thinking of her callousness, she felt her eyes swell and tingle with tears. Three times he knotted her shoe. Thus occupied, he seemed to her a figure of infinite pathos. Three times he unknotted it. But now, just as she wished to say something, could have said something, perhaps, here they were, Cam and James. They were off to the lighthouse together at last. She felt a sudden emptiness, a frustration. Her, her sympathy seemed to be cast back on her like a bramble sprung across her face. Her feeling had come too late. There it was ready, but he no longer needed it. Consider how often in moments of emotion, when we most need words, we find none. She saw her canvas white and uncompromising directly before her it seemed to rebuke her with its cold stare for all this hurry and agitation this folly and waste of emotion it drastically recalled her i foresee that this is going to be the devil of a struggle the design is so queer and masterful i'm always having to wrench my substance to fit it the design is certainly original and interests me hugely I should like to write away and away at it very quick and fierce. Where to begin? That was the question. At what point to make the first mark? I feel as if I were putting out my fingers tentatively on either side as I grope down a tunnel rough with odds and ends. One line placed on the canvas committed her to innumerable risks. One feels about in a state of misery. Well, the risk must be run. And then one touches the hidden spring. A mark made. Let me then, like a child, advancing with bare feet into a cold river, descend again into the stream. The brush descended. It flickered brown over the white canvas. It left a running mark. Style's a very simple matter. A second time she did it. A third time. It is all rhythm. And so, pausing and so flickering, she attained a dancing, a rhythmical movement, as if the pauses were one part of the rhythm and the strokes another, and all were related. Once you get that, you can't use the wrong words. And so, lightly and swiftly pausing, striking, she scored a canvas with brown, running, nervous lines, which had no sooner settled there than they enclosed a space. 
Now this is very profound, what rhythm is, and goes far deeper than words. Here she was again, she thought, stepping back to look at it. Drawn out of gossip, out of living, out of community with people, into the presence of this formidable ancient enemy of hers. This other thing, this truth, this reality, which suddenly laid hands on her, emerged stark at the back of appearances, and commanded her attention. A sight, an emotion, creates this wave in the mind long before it makes words to fit it. And in writing, such as my present belief, one has to recapture this and set this working, which has nothing apparently to do with words. And then, as it breaks and tumbles in the mind, it makes words to fit it. Why always be drawn out and hailed away? Why not be left in peace? Anyone moderately familiar with the rigors of composition will not need to be told the story in detail. How he wrote and it seemed good, read and it seemed vile, corrected and tore up, cut out, put in. His form roused one to perpetual combat challenged one to a fight in which there was one was bound to be worsted was in ecstasy in despair had his good nights and bad mornings snatched at ideas and lost them saw his book plain before him and it vanished acted people's parts as he ate mouthed them as he walked now cried now laughed could not decide whether he was the divinest genius or the greatest fool in the world Always, before she exchanged the fluidity of life for the concentration of painting, she had a few moments of nakedness where she seemed like an unborn soul, a soul reft of body, hesitating on some windy pinnacle and exposed without protection to all the blasts of doubt. Well, you see, I'm a failure as a writer. I'm out of fashion, old. My book a damp firework. I thought of never writing any more. Why then did she do it? Must be attacked for a feminist and hinted at for a sapphist. It would be hung in the servants' bedrooms. But it won't be taken seriously. It would be rolled up and stuffed under a sofa. Mrs. Wolfe is so accomplished a writer that all she says makes easy reading. What was the good of doing it then? This very feminine logic. And she heard some voice saying she couldn't paint, saying she couldn't create. A book to be put in the hands of girls. Charles Tansley used to say that, she remembered. Women can't paint, can't write. Coming up behind her, he'd stood close beside her. At dinner, he would sit right in the middle of the view. As long as you write, what you wish to write. That is all that matters. And whether it matters for ages or for only hours, nobody can say, but to sacrifice a hair of the head of your vision, a shade of its color, in deference to some headmaster with a silver pot in his hand, or to some professor with a measuring rod up his sleeve, is the most abject treachery. She must rest for a moment. And resting, the old question which traversed the sky of the soul perpetually. Who am I? What am I? And so on. These questions are always floating about in me. The vast, the general question, which was apt to particularize itself at such moments as these, darkened over her. What is the meaning of life? That was all, a simple question, one that tended to close in on one with years. The great revelation had never come. The great revelation perhaps never did come. Instead, there were little daily miracles, illuminations, matches struck unexpectedly in the dark. Why is there not a discovery in life? Something one can lay hands on and say, this is it. Mrs. Ramsey saying life, 
stand still here. It is not exactly beauty that I mean. It is that the thing is in itself enough, satisfactory, achieved. Mrs. Ramsay, making of the moment something permanent, as in another sphere, Lily herself tried to make of the moment something permanent. This was of the nature of a revelation. In the midst of chaos, there was shape, this eternal passing and flowing. Life stands still here, Mrs. Ramsay said. Now, after a little flagging and silence, she watched the boat take its way past the other boats out to sea. There he sits, she thought. She could not reach him. The sympathy she had given him weighed her down, <laughs> made it difficult to paint. A saying of Leonard's come in, comes into my head. Things have gone wrong somehow. Heaven be praised for it. The problem of space remained, she thought, taking up her brush again. It glared at her. The whole mass of the picture was poised upon that weight. Beautiful and bright, it should be on the surface, feathery and evanescent, one color melting into another, like the colors on a butterfly's wing. But beneath the fabric must be clamped together with, with bolts of iron. It was to be a thing you could ruffle with your breath and a thing you could not dislodge with a team of horses. And she began to lay on a, a red, a gray, and she began to model her way into the hollow there. This afternoon I arrived at some idea of a new form for a new novel. Suppose one thing should open out of another, only not for ten pages, but two hundred or so. Doesn't that give the looseness and lightness I want? Doesn't that get closer and yet keep form and speed and enclose everything, everything? The approach will be entirely different this time. No scaffolding, scarcely a brick to be seen, all crepuscular, but the heart, the passion, humor, everything as bright as fire in the mist. Mrs. Ramsey. Who knows what we are, what we feel? Who, who knows even at the moment of intimacy, this is knowledge. We do not know our own souls, let alone the souls of others. Human beings do not go hand in hand the whole stretch of the way. There is a virgin forest tangled pathless in each, a snowfield where even the print of birds' feet is unknown. Here we go alone and like it better so, always to have sympathy, always to be accompanied, always to be understood would be intolerable. It's an odd road to be walking, this of painting. Out and out one went further, until at last one seemed to be on a narrow plank, perfectly alone, over the sea. Why is life so tragic? So like a little strip of pavement over an abyss. I look down, I feel giddy. I wonder how I am ever to walk to the end. And as she dipped into the blue paint, she dipped too into the past there. Certainly there she was, in the very centre of that great cathedral space, which was childhood. There she was, from the very first. The dead, oh, the dead. I see her in her white dressing gown. One pitied them, one brushed them aside. The voice is still faintly in my ears. Mrs. Ramsay has faded and gone with her limited old-fashioned ideas. Decided, quick. She saw her there at the end of the corridor of years saying of all incongruous things. Marry, marry. Mrs. Ramsay had planned that Lily marry William Banks. He was the kindest of men. Perhaps had she lived she would have compelled it. The first scientist of his age, my husband says. All that summer, she'd said, poor William. The astonishing power that Mrs. Ramsay had over one. Makes me so unhappy. Do this, she said, and one did it. 
when I go to see him to find nothing nice in his house, no one to arrange the flowers. But one would have to say to her, it has all gone against your wishes. Poor Mrs. Ramsay, who would never know Lily stood here painting, had never married, not even William Banks. My first memory is of her lap. The scratch of some beads on her dress comes back to me as I press my cheek against it. The emptiness. The steps looked extraordinarily empty. Oh, Mrs. Rams. It did seem so safe thinking of her. Ghost, air, nothingness. And then suddenly she put her hand out and wrung the heart thus. I hear the tinkle of her bracelets as she came up at night to see if we were asleep. I lay awake sometimes and longed for her to come. What does it mean? How do you explain it all, she wanted to say, for the whole world seemed to have dissolved in this early morning hour into a pool of thought, a deep basin of reality, and one could almost fancy that a little tear would rent the surface of the pool. And then something would emerge, a hand would be shoved up, a, a blade would be flashed. It is not oneself, but something in the universe that one's left with. One sees a fin passing far out. You and I and she pass and vanish. Nothing stays, all changes, but not words, not paint. One might say even of this scrawl, of what it attempted, that it remained forever, she was going to say, or for the words spoken sounded even to herself too boastful, to hint wordlessly. When looking at a picture, she was surprised to find that she could not see it. Her eyes were full of a hot liquid which rolled down her cheeks. Was she, was she crying then for Mrs. Ramsay? <laughs> what was it? What did it mean? Life is, soberly and accurately, the oddest affair. Could it be that this was life? Startling, unexpected, unknown? If I could catch the feeling, I would the feeling of the singing of the real world. Mrs. Ramsay, Mrs. Ramsay. If she shouted long enough, loud enough, would Mrs. Ramsay return? But nothing happened. She remained a skimpy old maid holding a paintbrush. And now, slowly, the pain of the want and the bitter anger lessened and of their anguish left as antidote a relief that was balm in itself. And also, but more mysteriously, a sense of someone there, of Mrs. Ramsay, raising to her forehead a, a wreath of white flowers with which she went. It's strange how clearly she saw her, stepping with her usual quickness across the fields among those whose folds, purplish and soft, among whose flowers she vanished. And of course she was central. I suspect the word central gets closest to the general feeling I had of living so completely in her atmosphere that one never got far enough away from her to see her as a person. She was a whole thing. Talent House was full of her. Hyde Park Gate was full of her. For days after she had heard of her death, she had seen her thus, putting her wreath to her forehead and going unquestionably, unquestionably across the fields. And there is my last sight of her. She was dying. I came to kiss her. And as I crept out of the room, she said, Hold yourself straight, my little goat. 
She looked at the bay beneath her. The sea stretched like silk across the bay. She seemed to be standing up to the lips in some substance to move and float and sink in it. Yes, for these waters were unfathomably deep. Into them had spilled so many lives, the Ramses, the children's, and all sorts of waifs and strays of things besides a, a washerwoman with a basket, a rook, a red hot poker, the purples and gray greens of flowers, some common feeling which held the whole together. I ask myself sometimes whether one is not hypnotized as a child by a silver globe, by life, and whether this is living. I should like to take the globe in my hands and feel it quietly, round, smooth, heavy, and hold it day after day. It was some such feeling of completeness, perhaps, which ten years ago, standing almost here where she stood now, had made her say that she must be in love with the place. Love had a thousand forms and shapes. If my life has a base that it stands upon, if it is a bowl that one fills and fills and fills, then my bow, without a doubt, stands upon this memory. It is of lying half asleep, half awake, in bed, in the nursery at St. Ives. It is of hearing the waves breaking, one, two, one, two, and sending a splash of water over the beach, and then breaking, one, two, one, two, behind a yellow blind, and feeling it is almost inconceivable that I should be here, of feeling the purest ecstasy I can conceive. But as the sky changed slightly and the sea changed slightly and the boats altered their positions, the view which a, a moment before had seemed miraculously fixed was now unsatisfactory. My proofs of Jacob's room come every other day. The, the disproportion upset some harmony in her mind. Uh, she felt an obscure distress. She turned to her picture. She had been wasting her morning. And the thing now reads thin and pointless. The words scarcely dint the paper. She could not achieve that razor edge of balance between two opposite forces, which was necessary. There was something perhaps wrong with the, the design. <laughs> she smiled ironically, for had she not thought when she began that she had solved her problem? He said nothing, but I reflected how what I'm doing is probably doing, being better done by Mr. Joyce. Then I began to wonder what is it that I am doing to suspect, as is usual in such cases, that I've not thought my plan out plainly enough. So to dwindle, niggle, hesitate which means that one's lost it was a miserable machine inefficient the human apparatus for painting or for feeling it always broke down at the critical moment when i cannot see words curling like rings of smoke round me i am in darkness i am nothing mrs ramsay Fifty pairs of eyes were not enough to get round that woman once. Here I come to one of the memoir writer's difficulties. One of the reasons why so many are failures. They leave out the person to whom things happened. The reason is that it is so difficult to describe any human being. One wanted most some secret sense, fine as air, with which to steal through keyholes and surround her where she sat in the room, talking, sitting silent in the window alone, which took to itself her thoughts, her, her imaginations, her desires. Until I was in my forties, the presence of my mother obsessed me. What did the hedge mean to her? What did the garden mean to her? I could hear her voice. What, it, what did it mean to her when a wave broke? I could see her. 
She would stop knitting for a second. She would look intent. I could imagine what she would do or say. Mrs. Ramsey, Mrs. Ramsey, to want and want and not to have. Mrs. Ramsey, sitting there quite simply in the chair, she flicked her needles to and fro, knitted a reddish brown stocking, cast a shadow on the step. There she sat. I reach what I might call my philosophy. Behind the cotton wool is hidden a pattern. You must have reached it. We, I mean all human beings, are connected with this. But the lighthouse had become almost invisible had melted away into a blue haze. That the whole world is a work of art. Hamlet or a Beethoven quartet is the truth about this vast mass that we call the world. But there is no Shakespeare, there is no Beethoven, certainly and emphatically there is no God. We are the words, we are the music. Whatever she had wanted to give him when he left her that morning, she had given him at last. We are the thing itself. He has landed, she said. It is finished. I feel that by writing, I am doing what is far more necessary than anything else. She turned to her canvas. There it was, her picture. Yes, with all its greens and blues, its lines running up and across, its attempt at something. It would be hung in the attics, she thought. It would be destroyed. But what did it matter, she asked herself, taking up her brush again. She looked at her canvas. It was blurred. With a sudden intensity, as if she saw it clear for a second, she drew a line there in the center. It was done. It was finished. Yes, she thought, laying down her brush in extreme fatigue. I've had my vision. The end. Um, Amy? Yes. Hi. Would you, shall we do a Q&A? What do you think? Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> should we make ourselves gallery? Should we stop um, sharing? Uh, whatever you think. There we go. <clears throat> I think and we should do gallery, I think. We'll be together again. There we are. Ooh, look at everybody. That was incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. It was a pleasure. You guys. Oh, Thank such you. a gift. <laughs> I just have to now formally thank Drew for figuring the tech out, which was not so easy. And along with steering me towards uh, passages in the diaries as, as, and, and uh, helping to dramaturg, he also actually figured out how to make this uh, a PowerPoint with video in it. And, and uh, we we have a new title for drew that should be added to his official titles and it's wizard yes we with a capital w it's dram dramaturg slash wizard <laughs> yeah that was really quite that was really beautiful thank you
people have a lot to say in the chat. <laughs> Someone has their hand raised, Hannah. Hannah. Yes, please. You're uh, muted, Hannah. Can she unmute? Oh, everyone's muted by, uh, there we go. That should work. Sorry, I can um, unmute myself then. Um, thank you so, so much for that. That was truly um, incredible. Um, I feel so many things that I can't even put into words because I'm also writing some kind of wolf based theatre at the moment. So it's really fantastic to kind of see just what magic can be created by combining the rich source material that she has given us and making it into something completely new and wonderful. Um, I would love to know a little bit about your process and how this was born. Um... Well, Kathy and I did a, a presentation last year uh, with Drew, which in, which involved the letters of Vanessa, uh, Virginia, and uh, Lytton Strachey. And Amy asked um, us to do something this year. And I thought, I mean, in the spirit of, uh, I just was lucky enough to be able to attend Beth's uh, paper yes, uh, just a few minutes ago, I decided to take on something really terrifying. <laughs> and that was to paint the painting in uh, at the end of To the Lighthouse, which I think for anybody who's ever picked up a brush, it's the thing that you want to do. You want to see that painting. What would that painting be? And I thought I'd, I, at first I had this maniacal idea that I would actually paint it while we were doing the thing, but then um, cooler heads prevailed and realized that that would be a nightmare in just so many ways. Um, but still, I, I was committed to the idea of, of juxtaposing Lily's process with Wolf's process. And, um, and then I went and I uh, started painting at my friend Jane's house in Maine, which is right on the um, on the water. And so it was a perfect place to try to do this. But turns out painting's really hard. <laughs> so I mean, I can show you the. I I went through a few of them. Um, if you can see, I don't know if you can. Uh, this was the first one, which I realized, no, 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 it can't be so sort of straightforward. And I, I needed a bigger doorway, so I did that. And then I went and I thought, maybe I need a bigger canvas. So I did that and I thought, no, it's still not working. And then I thought, well, maybe it needs to be done from the side. And so this was based on a sort of odd uh, painting, uh, an odd photograph that I, uh, that you can find if you really swirl around looking. And then, um, and that was a thought, and then I thought, well, maybe it needs to be more sort of Bloomsbury, uh, you know, a little more edgy, a little more modern, a little, and then I thought, no, I, I, it still wants to be, you know, uh, a pretty straightforward, I, I don't know. This was the one that I ended up spending the most time on. But I, you know, I have to say, I have a million of them. <laughs> if anybody wants to take them off my hands, you would be, um, I would be delighted. But anyway, uh, in doing it, I mean, I used to be a painter, I used to be a scenic artist, that's how I made a living for a long time. Um, and uh but i haven't painted for years and i realized oh you know there's a lot to catch up on and a lot to to uh remember how to do so um but i'm sure that i am not alone in having had this idea of painting that painting but um yeah the, the, that that's how it happened and then uh kathy and i you know have been working together and have been friends since 90 what? 89, right? 89, since 1989. 
when we, we met in the rehearsal for um, uh, Angels in America, uh, an early uh, workshop of it in LA, and I sat down next to Kathy, and Kathy um, had uh, at the table at the rehearsal in the rehearsal room a copy of Mrs. Galloway's short stories, and I said, "Oh, you're a fan of Wolf." And um, Kathy said, "Yes," and I'm actually thinking of maybe putting some of these stories together to make it a um, a a theater piece. And I thought. Oh, okay. This is my new best friend, and we have been friends ever since. And um, I'm just so delighted that we were able to um, get get to work on this together. And of course, Drew. Drew made yes. himself indispensable last time. The part that Ellen just left out about that story is that. I didn't put the stories together. Ellen put the stories together. And, and, and we did it in last year's conference. Like, and made a piece, and we did part of it last year. Elephant, go ahead. Elisa? Hi. Yeah, and Ellen's leaving out the fact that she also wrote up play version of Mrs. Dell. Oh, right. Oh, well, there's yeah. That. Yeah. Yeah. There, is, there is that small thing. Yeah. Well, that's how I met you all, all you fabulous people, was I came to the 2015 uh, the, the, the conference in Bloomsburg. Um, it was done before uh, at the Delaware conference. Um, Suzanne Bellamy challenged Isota Tucker Epps. The two of them decided they would each do uh, a To the Lighthouse painting and that um, they would not show them to each other until the conference. And so there was a conference session where the two paintings were unveiled <laughs> to each other. And I've posted Suzanne's in the chat and I'm now going through my collection of um, Isota's paintings, trying to find the one that was to the lighthouse. And I'm I'm not sure if I can if I'm finding it or, or not. That's great. Um, I, I thanks so much for posting. That's great. Yeah. So you can see at least what Suzanne thought. Yeah. Oh, here. Uh, well. This is a picture of Isota with a painting of hers called Legacy. But anyway, so yeah, it's a, it's really fascinating. Yeah, it's a it's a really fun. Oh, that's great. It's a really fun problem to try to solve. That's I great. actually did. I actually have one. I did. I have a print. You have to post it. A silk screen print. Okay. <laughs> But I also well, thought I don't want to steal it, but anyway, I'll, I'll look for it. One of the things that I wanted to do also was to, I mean, Kathy and I can speak feelingly to this as actors and theater people. It's been a really rough two years, as you can imagine. And I am, if I never have to do another, you know, Zoom per performance, it will be a happy, happy day. Um, but I thought, well, if we're going to do it on Zoom, then there's got to be a way to turn this into a virtue. We've got to actually do something that would be better done on Zoom than uh, you know, on the stage where you can't really see it very well. And I thought, well, that would be kind of fun to, to, to do a painting um, that you could actually see clearly, yeah. I don't know if the if the painting is still up in one of the squares. No, I don't know. I mean, if you put it back up again, it, it just yeah, make, I can, I make can it share. one of the squares. That would be great. Can you say that? Yeah, but then yeah. everything else goes away is the problem. OK. Yeah, there's no other way to do it. I don't That's think. OK. They've seen enough of it. OK. <laughs> <laughs> You can post it into the chat, so if, if people oh, want to. 
tonight. Yeah. That would be great. Thanks, Drew. That'd be okay. Uh, I can't see anybody else. Hands up. I think we're all just sort of stunned. <laughs> Hannah, you had such a great question because you are working in writing play, as playwright yourself. It was a really great question to know about that um, development process. I think I am just so interested in this life, this friendship that Alan and Kathy have and the ways that it has blessed the community so much and how um, what it's like to work together on these projects as friends. I really loved when you described meeting each other, Ellen. And I don't, you know, I just certainly don't want to invade your privacy, but I do think we're we're really interested in you as as playwright, as actress, both of you. Um, I don't know if there's any more you want to share. Well, I think that you all know what it's like to to fall into friendship with people over Wolf you know, the sense of meeting a like mind, meeting somebody who's passionate about the thing, the things that you're passionate about. And Wolf is a very distinct passion, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why I think this community is so dear to all of us. It's because we know something deep about each other in knowing that we love her and her work in the way that we do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Madeline. Go ahead. Oh, damn it. I'm so sorry. No, that's fine. I just, first of all, that was so moving. I really, really thank you and appreciate you for the work that you did on that. Um, and um, also Drew for the work you did on the, the behind the scenes tech. It was really incredible. Um, I noticed also that um, in the interleaving of Wolf's words and Lily's words that um, there was so much about Wolf's mother. And, um, and so I wondered whether you would wanna comment on that. Um, I mean, it was incredibly moving and beautiful, I have to say, um, but I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit more about that aspect of the interleaving and, and how powerful it was. Um, Thank you. I, in the first uh, versions of the script, the I hadn't brought in the moments of being sections from, and but then I found that if, if in looking at that last chapter, Mrs. Ramsey and um, this sense of Julia Stephen, it just absolutely permeates. It's like an indigo dye. It just permeates that chapter and. And then when I came across those passages, like the whole thing about how central um, Julia was and that she was Talon House, she was, um, she, she, every, every place that she was, it was full of her. And, and then the passage, I mean, you know, the passage about her last, uh, the last words of her mother. I mean, it just kills me. And I just feel that that, that that moment is this kind of emotional wave that you that uh you know you rise up on and it crests and it breaks and then the rest of the and then the rest of the chapter um the the book is the is the crashing of that wave and it's move on onto the shore and the curve of it onto the shore is the moment when the last uh mark is made on the canvas when the vision is finished is when that tide pulls back in but i do think that you know um she is i think that yes she ends up uh wolf ended up uh really reckoning with her father in a, a really surprising and extraordinary way but it was really it was her mother, who the book was really, uh, uh, it was a reckoning with. And I think, you know, she, she said many times, uh, as I quoted, 
that she was obsessed with her mother until she'd written the book and that she couldn't sort of, there was no moving past her mother um, until she'd written that book. And on a much less um, exalted level, I had that experience um, myself as a writer, which was that until my early 40s, I, 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 there was a way I couldn't emotionally move past my past and my, my mother in particular, the suffering of her, um, her many struggles. And I wrote a play that was not autobiographical, but was sort of emotionally autobiographical called Tongue of a Bird, which was a real attempt to uh, reckon with that, um, with her, with her figure. And I became, it did something for me that was really profound. And it, it allowed me writing that play, whatever one thinks of that play, uh, provided me with the means of moving on with my life and my work. And I needed to write that play. It was a very difficult play to write. It took me eight years, but and my mother hated it, <laughs> but oh. <laughs> um, I needed to write it in order to move on. And uh, I, so I always have had this kind of, my connection with To the Lighthouse, which was the first wolf book that I read. And my mother was a wolf scholar and she gave it to me. When I was 13, she, realized that you know maybe i was capable of reading wolf and she was very worried about my response because she thought you know if she doesn't like it what the hell am i going to do with this girl and uh she would go up she would sneak looks at where i was where the where the um bookmarker was in the, in the text and finally i came downstairs into the kitchen and i said i can't believe it's just uncanny what this woman does, you know, she, she actually articulates what it is to think and feel through a moment of being. And my mother was like, okay, you can still stay in the family. But so it's, um, you know, as complicated as, you know, this book is wrapped up with mothers and my mother. And so uh, it was like, it was kind of profound to be grappling with it, even in this way. I, ha I had that thought when I was watching Ellen, I, I was remembering your mother was a wolf scholar and I thought, I wondered, you know, if this writing this and performing it with wolf scholars is. Yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting to go around. I mean, this was the gateway drug for me, but I'm, and I think it, it's the first uh, wolf novel for a lot of people. Rita, can you unmute yourself? Okay, good. Okay. Um, I guess, first of all, I just want to thank you for this amazing performance. It was stunning and it changed my relationship to these texts that I thought I knew so well, including on being ill. So I, I, I was really happy to see that in there as well. So thank you. Thank you so much for this. I appreciate that. But that passage, yeah. the, the, you know, we don't, we do not go accompanied yeah that's the one that just uh, i don't know that it was it. it was perfect perfectly <laughs> fit in i loved it and um my question i apologize already to those who weren't here for last year's performance but it it is about the differences between uh, the two plays and the materials that you used and how you you worked uh, with them for these two beautiful pieces. So last year's plays, because it was, uh, it used letters, which are formal, formally much more dialogical. That meant each, three, each one of you three inhabited only one character as multifaceted as they were. And they were all in the same um, plane in the sense that, you know, they were, real people who wrote those real letters as much, um, you know, they, they were all in, the, in that same plane of existence and you put them to, um, to the use that you did in the play. Now with this play, 
you're mixing so many genres, you're mixing the essays, you're mi mixing the autobiographical pieces, you're mixing more purely um, fictional characters, even though, of course, with that resonance with uh, Mrs. Ramsey and Julia. So I was, I was just wondering how different it was for you in terms of your composition and making that, the, the play for this particular play, making it cohere in terms of who you inhabited in each of the fragments that you brought and when you constructed the play. And that was a long question, I apologize. Yeah, I mean, I think I had an easier time of it. Kathy, you can talk about um, your experience of it, but but I was playing a person grounded in a reality and a very specific through line, whereas Kathy was all over the place. It was um, the, the the basic structure were that there were two characters in the play, Lily and and Virginia Woolf. Um, it, but it was wonderful to be Mr. to loom as Mr. Ramsey um, in that way, and um, also to be to be to be uh, Julia Stephen, Mrs. Ramsey, for a minute too, so that um, it, 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 because this is uh, this all all the work that Ellen and I have done together um, with Virginia Woolf have. Ha, has um, had this same sort of double reality, which is that uh, at base, there, it's all Virginia Woolf wrote it all. So, and she is like all writers, all the characters are herself and like all portrait painters, all the portraits are of the painter. So that that's a place to begin from. And she um, loved the theater and writes very theatrically. So that in, uh, conversations and things it's it's fun she makes characters that are fun to play that's, that's and, and i think and the way this way this way particularly the way the way ellen established mr ramsey because you know we had mr ramsey and leslie and the horror of the notion of leslie living to be 96 um and the wonderful mirror image of you know women as the mirror that that reflects men back at twice their size so that there were all of those if you like directorial <laughs> indications i also find i mean what's very moving to me in reading the writer's diary um is to be reminded of her extraordinary struggles with self-doubt mm -hmm. and um, how often she was just gutted by bad reviews or even just the prospect of reviews of any kind and as a as a creative person it's just it's really comforting to 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 dip back into those letters and diary entries because um if she could feel that about her work, there is this way in which it just it, you 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 gird your loins as a as a writer and is like let's just go back into it and and I do love the um, that moment at the very very end of like well it will be hung in servants' bedrooms or or you know basically thrown away and yet you go back in and you do the work. And uh, that's why I ended it, ended Kathy's uh, words with writing is what I will, what I, I can't remember exactly what it is, Kathy. The most important thing to do yeah. after a long period of. And I mean, I've, you know, the world being in the state that it's in right now is so, um, profoundly disturbing and distracting on every level. And uh, I, I just, uh, it's its very, very hard to take art seriously, particularly one's little bit of whatever one is doing. And to, to realize that she was in the midst of these, uh, her own eras, horrendous struggles and still went back to the desk every day and still felt that, you know, what I can do is I can do my work. 
what I what I have to say, what I have to do is he's here for me. My desk is here. And I think that that's um, it's just a nice thing to be reminded of if you're a creative artist or if you're a, anybody who does what we all do. I mean, so much so many of us are teachers. This is what you got to do. You know, but I, I do find that 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 whole thing about I, you know, her many moments in the writer's diary where she thinks about throwing out an entire novel, you know, and the years just chucking it out the window. Um, over and over again. Thank God she kept going back to the desk. Even though she was incapable of um, of following Laurence Olivier's uh, uh, remarks about reviews, which is that you should never read them because the bad ones are devastating and the good ones are never good enough. <laughs> yeah, words that we have taken to our we heart. Ellen, do you remember uh, John Updike's line about reading reviews? Um, you shouldn't review read. You shouldn't read reviews because reading a review is like eating a sandwich that might contain bits of broken glass. Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I haven't heard that one. Yeah. Yes, I always but, think that even the ones your friends tell you to read, they're fine. There's always some toad lurking in the middle. There always is. Yeah. They don't know about the toad. And even if you don't read them, you know, you have friends who will say, um, yeah. I can't believe she said that, you know, she said this. <laughs> right. But the extra and the thing, you know, and Wolf was in a particularly difficult circumstance because she too wrote reviews and she too was not always kind. And there's a certain kind of courage and honor she showed in reading the in reading her own that it would have been i think she would have uh, I, I don't know um, i think she would have thought it was dishonorable in a way to try to hide from them i also think she was in a position of she was basically running a press you yeah. know i mean it's like people who are producers of theaters have to read the review right but god forbid you're a producer and you're also in the show and you are <laughs> You know, um, and that's the position that uh, she was in to some extent. Uh, and still, she had Leonard read a few of the reviews. Mm. She tried not to read all of them, but she yeah. did. She was drawn to them in that way that, I mean, we understand, but I've really gotten, you know, doctrinaire about it. I just don't. I don't. I Ellen, don't. That, rem that reminds me of that story you told about. Joe Papp when the reviews of Tony Kitchener's <laughs> Bright Room All Day came out. Yeah, I was in a play by Tony Kushner called one of his first plays called Bright Room Called Day, and we did it at the public theater where Joe Papp was uh, dying of liver cancer. We didn't know that at the time, but it was towards the end of his life, this extraordinary producer. And um, it was happening, we were doing the production, which is pretty edgy and involved a character who says many, many, you know, offensive things, who everybody thought was Tony, of course. And, uh, and people hated that play so much that they would actually, they would not only leave, but they would leave and throw their programs on the on the set as they left. I've never actually been afraid of audiences, but I was afraid of the audience. And this, the previews went on forever and ever and ever because they wanted to run the show. They knew the reviews were going to be bad, but they didn't realize how bad they were. And this was in the era when on opening night, you actually got your reviews, you know, the, the newspapers would come in, actual physical newspapers into the opening night party which you know at two o'clock in the morning and i was sitting in a banquette in this uh bar with joe pap and i were on either side of tony and the review was handed to pap and pap read it and we could not help but read it and it was the worst review i've ever ever read it was frank rich basically saying this man should be stopped he should not be allowed to write any more plays. And then there was this 
awful pause after we'd all read this thing and Joe Pat put his arm around Tony and he said, I'm going to extend it a week, <laughs> which was no producer in their right mind would ever do that now. And that's why Joe Papp was Joe Papp. But if that critic, if Frank Rich had had his way, Tony would never have written another play. But what happened was that Tony had already gotten the commission money for Angels in America, what turned out to be Angels in America, and he was broke and he couldn't give it back. <laughs> so he spent the next seven years writing that play. But um, yeah. That's probably a good note to end on. I just realized we have to get out of the church on time because the next thing oh. starts in four minutes. Um, so oh, we need oh to, sorry. <laughs> yeah, we need to get to Jacob's room at 100. So thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Ellen and Kathy. This was lovely. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Well, this is the best audience in the world. Yes. <laughs> See you soon, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.